And that's the other thing. I think sometimes, you know, like I go back sometimes, I'm not always live, but people go back and we post these and then watch them. So it's always nice option for people too to, to see if it's not incredibly well attended, it still gets seen. Right. For sure. For those of you that are here, just um, we're going to give it just a couple more minutes to, to uh, let some last minute people in uh, before we get started. All right, Blake, what do you think? I'm ready when you are. All right. All right, everyone. Well, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I will continue to look for uh, participants as they come through. Uh, so welcome to our last presentation in the Big 8 Fall Connection Leadership Series. My name is Clayton Krieger, and I'm the Athletic Director at Janesville Parker High School. Uh, as you participate this evening, please remember that this video will be recorded. Therefore, you may mute or hide your video to fit your level of comfort throughout this discussion. Uh, with that having been said, if you're comfortable, please turn that video on for our discussion. I know uh, Blake wants to see your face, as, as do we, as uh, we talk throughout the night. As a reminder, we ask that you continue to keep your mic muted unless you are participating in conversation. This evening, I will continue to monitor the chat, so please utilize this feature if you have any questions or comments. With that, Parker High School and the Big 8 Conference would like to welcome Mr. Blake Williams from Battle Tested as a guest speaker to our Big 8 Leadership Series. Blake is the founder and president of Battle Tested. Battle Tested serves high school and college coaches and athletes through team building, leadership development, character development, and mental performance coaching. Blake is also the author of The Battle Tested Teammate, a book written to help student athletes become better teammates, student athletes, and individuals. 
Messages and stories from Blake can be seen every week on the free Battle Tested app, which is available at any mobile app store. The Big 8 Athletic Conference is honored to have Mr. Williams put on his mental performance coaching hat this evening to speak to us on a topic that he is extremely knowledgeable and passionate about, cultivating confidence for improved performance in student athletes. So without further ado, I introduce to you, Mr. Blake Williams. Thank you, appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. I didn't know I was gonna be bringing up the rear tonight. There's a little bit of pressure with that, right? Gotta to, you know, try to say them, they say the best for, for last, hopefully, right? So, uh, so cultivating confidence, right? And why am I passionate about it is one, because when I was your age, I didn't have a whole lot of it. And it certainly held me back athletically because I didn't have great confidence. And I've yet to meet uh, a coach or a student athlete has, who has told me, you know what, Blake, my, my student athletes, they got all the confidence they need. They don't need any more confidence. I haven't met a student athlete that said, no, I'm, I'm always confident 100% of the time, I'm good. We all could utilize more confidence in certain situations we face in life. So um, the, the, the mental side of sports, if you're not a believer already, I hope to convince you that, hey, this is an important part of your success. So many people have all the physical skills in the world, but they lack the mental skills to be able to help them be successful. So we want to make sure that we are putting in some work towards the mental side of our game. Now, I call this presentation cultivating confidence. One, because there's alliteration there. It sounds nice, right? Cultivating confidence. I could have very easily used the word developing confidence. That's really what I mean by this is that, hey, we need to develop our confidence in order to help us uh, play better in our sports. And I think probably all of you are here because, hey, I'd like to be a better athlete. I'd like to be more successful in my sport. And I've got to give a shout out to those of you that are here. Just being here tonight shows me and probably shows uh, our ADs in the room as well and coaches that, hey, uh, that young man, that young woman, they care about getting better. Um, so I appreciate you giving up a little bit of your time on a Tuesday evening. So let's get rolling here. So why in the world should we even be confident? Why is it important? First of all, it helps you recover from mistakes quicker. And if you had your uh, cameras on and I said, hey, can you raise your hand if you've ever made a mistake in your sport? You could all raise your hand, right? We've all been there. We've all made the mistakes, some worse than others, but we make mistakes in our sport. So many student athletes wear those mistakes for minutes later, quarters later, games later. They continue to let the mistakes bother them because they've never forgotten and recovered from the past mistakes. They continue to make more. So being confident helps us recover quicker from our mistakes helps us to perform with less fear. So I have less fear when I'm on the court and maybe I'm about to shoot that critical free throw in the game. Well, I've got a lot of confidence in my free throw shooting ability. So I have less fear going into it. So it helps us perform with less fear and anxiety, helps us to stay calm and composed as we perform out there, allows us to take necessary risks. Sometimes in sports, we need to take risks, right? And if I have courage, that allows me and helps me to take those risks that I need to take to step up my game here or to step in that situation there. Confidence helps us do that. It helps us to play assertively, not tentatively. And maybe you've seen it, right? I know the coaches in the house have. We've seen when players play tentatively. They're not confident. They're playing. They're, they're halfway doing it. Maybe in the, I've seen it a lot in volleyball. The, the swing, instead of taking the full swipe at the ball, they're just kind of halfway doing it because I don't want to spike it out of bounds or hit it into the net. So I'm, I'm being careful. So if I'm confident, I can play more freely in that way. It allows me to trust my skills. You ladies and gentlemen, you work so many hours to improve your skills in your sport. If you don't have confidence when you hit the court, hit the field, then all that work you've done is held back because now I'm not able to trust all the work that I've done because maybe it's not enough. Maybe I haven't done all I need to do. When you get on into competition, that is not the time to question that. That is the time just to trust your skills that you've worked on and developed thus far and just let them flow. Kind of get in that zone that athletes often talk about. So these are reasons why we want to be confident student athletes. So I think it's important that we maybe define what exactly is a self-confident athlete. I'm gonna play this video for you. You see, it's pretty old. Uh, I was 16 years old. I'm dating myself when uh, this <laughs> video came out. Let me play this short video for you, and I'll tell a story behind it. Opening day in Houston, where the Giants rolled to an 8-3 to victory, an impressive sign of things to come, especially when rookie Will Clark became the 53rd player ever to hit a home run 
in his first big league at bat. Nolan Ryan was the victim. I'm walking up to the plate going, well, you know, I'm just going to look for this fastball because I've never seen anything that fast before in my life. So uh, first pitch to me was a curveball and like really surprised me. And uh, I started giggling a little bit and I asked the catcher, I said, why is he throwing me a curveball? He says, just switching things up. And, uh, you know, two pitches later, I got one of my fastballs. And when I hit it, I hit it good, but I didn't know it was going out. I was hoping that it would hit off the wall or something. And uh, it got out, and I was just ecstatic coming all the way back to home plate. And every time my mom and dad are in the stands, when I hit a home run, I'll point to them just to say thank you for being here. And uh, that's what I did that day. So you athletes probably don't know either of those players there. Or maybe you've heard of one, if not both of them. But... Uh, both were great major league baseball players, but Nolan Ryan, let me, the, the pitcher, let me mention him first. Nolan Ryan was known as the Ryan Express. He was the hardest pitcher in major league baseball at the time, where now, if you look, watch the World Series, they've got multiple guys on both teams that can throw it 100 miles plus. Nolan Ryan was the only guy. He was the guy doing it before anybody else in the world was doing it. He was the guy just throwing harder than anybody else. And so he was known to just blow guys away. He holds the major league record for strikeouts. He has seven no hitters, a ton of records this guy still holds as a pitcher. Now, Will Clark, the guy you saw, who's a rookie in that uh, video there, uh, he came from Mississippi State. You know, um, he won the Gold Spikes Award. And that's the award given to the best amateur baseball player. So he played at Mississippi State. He went on to play in the Olympics as well, representing the US before he turned a pro. Now, before this game, he's being interviewed by a reporter. And the reporter says, hey, Will, hey, Will. Um, how do you feel about having to go against Nolan Ryan today, right? And Will's response was, well, the way I see it, Nolan Ryan has to face Will Clark today. You know, very confident statement. I'm not worried about facing him. He needs to worry about facing me. That's a self-confident athlete. So I've come up with this definition of what a self-confident student athlete is. Houston. It is that athlete that has a strong belief in their ability to execute the skills required of their role on the team. All of you have a role on the teams you're a part of. You all do. And when you have a strong belief in your ability to go out there and do what coach has asked you to do, whether that's to be a starter, the sixth man, first off the bench, never off the bench, whatever it is, whatever role I have, do I have confidence in my ability? Do I believe in my ability to go out there and do it? That makes me a self-confident athlete. Now, I'd like to engage you. I can't see your faces to can tell if you're tracking with me. So I want you to open up that chat box for me. And I want you to answer this question. Um, when you see a self-confident athlete or confident athlete, what, what do you see? Like maybe give me a word that you think describes someone who is a confident Opening athlete. Day in Houston, if I can get this video roll. to stop playing. So use that chat box there. I'd like to see some feedback. Uh, give me a word or two that describes what you see when you see a confident athlete, a confident player. Savage. Thank you, Katie. I like that word. Someone who is relaxed. Oh, I like that, Nolan. You sent that just to me, but... Um, Thank you for answering. Uh, brave, determined, poised. I like those. I like those. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any others? There's a skilled from Carson. Thank you, Carson. And none of these are wrong, right? All of these are things that when I see, and we've all seen them, when I see the confident athlete, these are things we see. Uh, we got an answer of focused as well. These are things we see, right? So they're not really hard to miss. And I guess we're going to have to go past this screen to get that video to stop. So we want to be this type of athlete. Why? Because of all those reasons I showed in the previous slide about what it helps us to do and to be as an athlete when we are confident. So there are two types of confidence. And I uh, can only assume at this point in time, you probably have pen and paper and you're ready to write. And I hope you are, because if you don't write it now, um, you're definitely going to need it later because we're doing an activity where you will need uh, pen and paper. So get that handy if you don't have it with you now. So two types of confidence in the world of uh, athletics. Let's talk about what those are and define those. The first is what we call proactive confidence. Confidence in my skills that I possess prior to competition. So before the game ever starts, I have a certain level of confidence, and that is called proactive 
active confidence, right? I've, I've, I've gone out and gotten it. It's not reactive confidence. I've been proactive. I've gone out and I've done certain things that has given me confidence in the skills that I have that the coach wants me to use for my role. And I've got confidence in those skills prior to competition. So that's proactive confidence. And then the second type of confidence is called stable confidence. Confidence that I maintain, hopefully, in my skills during competition. So one's prior to competition and one is during. Very vital, right, during competition because we've been in games before where maybe things haven't always gone our way, right? Maybe I've made mistakes, I've had bad turnovers, I've, I've thrown interceptions, you know, whatever it is, I've made mistakes. And now it's hard to all of a sudden perhaps keep my confidence level up. So we want to make sure that in order and understand in order for us to be our best from a confidence standpoint, we got to make sure that during competition, regardless of what happens, am I able to maintain my confidence? Sometimes you hear basketball players, especially at the professional level, they say, you know, hey, a shooter is going to shoot. Yeah, I might miss five, six, seven shots in a row, but I'm going to keep shooting because I know eventually you're going to stop, start falling for me because I'm a shooter. That's what I do. And to me, that takes a lot of confidence because I've been in games before when I started to shoot and I started to miss consecutively. What did I want to do? I want to stop shooting because I felt like, oh, coach is, coach is probably wondering, why does this guy keep shooting? He keeps missing every shot. My teammates are probably wondering the same thing. So two types of confidence, proactive and stable. Uh, the most challenging one probably being the stable, right? When, when things aren't going my way, how can I still try to find the confidence that I need to be my best? in competition. All right, moving on. Confidence sources. Where do I find my confidence from? You see here a laundry list of things that I've listed here. We're going to run through these because I want to uh, ask a couple of questions. So I may put a couple of you guys uh, or ladies on the spot. Uh, so past success in my sport, right? Hey, I've had success before. Uh, that helps fuel my confidence going forward. Uh, hey, I got a great practice plan. I really feel like the way I practice helps set me up for success. So that gives me confidence in my abilities. Uh, positive feedback from others. People are saying great things about me. So, hey, that feeds my confidence. I've got supportive people in my life. The quality of practice and training that I get to experience at my school helps me. Uh, I got great coaches and I, I really believe in my coaches and it helps me feel more confident. My physical skills, I've got what I need. I got belief in my physical talent. My uniform, something as simple as my uniform can make me feel more confident. Some teams wear the special all black jerseys sometimes and they, they just play with a different level of, of confidence and belief. But sometimes it's like if my uniform doesn't fit me really good, uh, maybe I feel a little awkward. And so therefore I'm not as confident going in. I'm worried about something I shouldn't, right? I should be focused on my game, not my uniform. But something as simple as that can affect your confidence. My warm-up routine, off-season camps that I go to to get extra work in. Uh, man, the game conditions are awesome. And so I, I play great when it's great weather. This is my time. Um, I've got teammates and coaches that cheer me on. I've got uh, great mental preparation going into the game. Maybe I spend time visualizing or uh, working with a mental performance coach. Um, man, I've really studied up on my opponents. And so therefore, I feel prepared. It gives me confidence. Um, performing under pressure. Maybe that's something I'm really good at, so it helps me going forward. Relationships with teams, my fitness level. Home court advantage maybe gives you confidence. I got special spectators. My grandmama uh, from out of town has showed up. She's here to watch me and support me tonight, or maybe that cute girl, that cute boy is up in the stands. I know they're here to watch me and cheer me on, right? That gives me a little extra boost of confidence, perhaps. Uh, level of competition. Maybe, hey, I know who we're about to play. We beat them 52 to zero last game. Um, I feel pretty confident going into this game as well. Number of reps you've taken. Some of you have taken so many reps working on your handles, working on your, your tackling abilities, whatever sports you play. You've got so many reps under your belt and that helps give you confidence. The officials, the fans, all those things can affect your confidence level. Now, these are a list of, I don't know, 22 or so different things that you might get confidence from. So if you could in that chat box again, or if you'd like to unmute yourself, I certainly welcome that. I would love to know what are, what are things for you? Maybe I've listed some here that definitely help your confidence, but maybe you have something else outside of this that you'd love to say, hey, Blake, here's something that I do that helps me with my confidence, uh, whether it's before a game or, or even during a game. 
Uh, so put it in the box, you know, the chat box, if you will, or if you'd like to unmute yourself, feel free to do that. So the question is, hey, what are the things that help give you more confidence? Ben says preparation, Evan says reps, uh, which is also the, that as well. Cameron, lifting gives him confidence. Thank you, sir. Anything totally different from what we might see on this slide here? Things that give you confidence. Trust in teammates, mental preparation, consistency. Good stuff. I like uh, several votes for trust in teammates. Workouts, thanks, Jax. Training. Always being prepared, yes. Oh, I hate the feeling of being unprepared. It does not give you a vote of confidence when you're going into a game. Good stuff. So we have these things, right? Belief that you'll get it done. Thank you, Davis. So we have things that help us feel confident. I, some people will tell me, hey, I have a certain routine that I go through, a pregame warm-up that I go through, and that gives me confidence. I have special music that I like, like to listen to on my, on my beats, and that helps me feel more confident. Again, these are yours, right? We're trying to find what are the things that help you feel confident, because that's what's most important. Not what a, is great for me or great for someone else in our chat, but what's great for you. Making sure you know what those things are so that you can do them. Now, let me ask a question. So I'm gonna uh, put a couple of people on the, uh, on the spot here and I uh, hope you'll work with me. If you, for some reason, can't unmute your microphone, you can put it in the chat, let me know. But I want someone to point out for me, looking at this list that we've got on the screen, what might be a couple, two or three, that would be something that might help your proactive confidence. And I'll remind you, we said proactive confidence is the confidence that I um, try to, to build up and to have before I ever step onto the field, before I ever go into competition, but go into a game, this is where I get my um, confidence from. So if I can ask Gavin Flynn to unmute your microphone, Gavin, if you don't mind, and just give me a couple, three from these lists that say, hey, these would be things that would be considered uh, sources of proactive confidence. Are you able to unmute yourself, Gavin? Um, I think that uh, like uh, a warm up routine. Yep. Uh, off season camps. Yep. Or like the like the relationships with your teammates. Yeah, give me one more. Um, like the number of reps you've taken. Yes, absolutely. All things that I'm doing prior to competition that help me. Thank you so much. All right, how about Ian? Uh, Ian, can you unmute yourself and you give me maybe four things on this list, three or four things that you would say, hey, these actually can help you with your stable confidence, maintaining your confidence during competition. Uh, game condition, um, cheering teammates, cheering fans, uh, the officials, uh, special spectators, and uh, home court. Very good. Thank you, sir. All things that help fuel. So right there's on this list, we got examples of proactive and we got examples of things that help with our stable confidence. And also notice here, we've got things on this list that you don't control, right? You don't control game conditions. You don't control quality of officials. You don't control how the fans are going to cheer or even how your teammates and coaches are going to cheer. You might come to expect certain things from them, but you don't control those things. So we want to make sure that when we're working on our confidence, your confidence, you focus on things you can, you can control, right? What can I control to help me feel and be more confident and focus on those things? Don't focus on the things you cannot control. All right. Hey, thank you for participating, gentlemen. Let's move on to the next slide. Now, just as there are things that build up our confidence, there are things, ladies and gentlemen, that will crush your confidence. Confidence killers, I call them. So let's take a look at what some confidence killers are, things that we need to avoid at all costs. One, I have strict expectations on my performance. I have a sophomore son in high school, and he has suffered with this in his life. And I worked one-on-one -on -one with a lot of student athletes, and I've seen a lot of student athletes that struggle with this. Um, they go into the game with such strict or high expectations on their performance that they probably will not live up to the majority of the time. And when they don't live up to the, their expectations, 
what do they do? They start to slip. The confidence starts to, starts to come down. Why? Because, well, I'm not three for three. I, I had a goal to be three to three at the plate today, and I'm not three for three at the plate today. I actually made an error, two in the field. And I, I have a, a rule where I only make one error a season, and I just made two in this game. Strict expectations can kill your uh, confidence. So we need to make sure that I don't focus on strict expectations. I focus on um, performance cues, I like to call them. What are some little things that I can do uh, to focus on that help me make sure that I'm setting myself up for success? So for example, I'll use my son as an example. So instead of going to a game saying, hey, I'm gonna go three for three at the plate, maybe he goes in um, from a batting standpoint that says, hey, I'm gonna make sure uh, I distribute my weight properly and I get my, my hands where they need to be before the pitch comes. And if I do those two little things right, that helps me have greater opportunity for success. It doesn't mean I'm going to get a hit. Absolutely not. It just means I have, uh, I'm set up right. And so I have greater opportunity perhaps to have success. In the field, maybe instead of focusing on not making any errors, maybe he focuses on as soon as the ball is hit, of getting his glove to the dirt, you know, whatever it is, you know, something like that. Some, what are some small performance cues that I can focus on that helps make sure I'm set up for success versus judging my performance on this strict level of performance that I expect. Uh, a lot of times people that do that are what we call perfectionists. Uh, you might be one of them, but we wanna make sure that we don't have too strict of expectations. Another thing that can kill our confidence is if you have underperformed in practice lately. <clears throat> people tell me, oh, you know, I just haven't been practicing well. I haven't been hitting my shots. I haven't been throwing the ball well. I haven't been doing whatever else in practice for whatever reason the last few few days. And so now going into um, going into competition, I'm just not confident. I'm just not confident. Practice is an opportunity for us to do exactly that, just to practice. It's to work on skills, it's to try to develop ourselves um, among other things, but we cannot allow our successes or especially our failures in practice to determine, am I going to be confident or not going into competition? We cannot focus too much on, hey, have I failed? You know, because so many times we fail, what are we doing? We're learning from the failure. We're learning, coaches making sure I'm, I'm getting in the right spot here and I'm, I'm tweaking this, and I'm tweaking that. And yeah, I may have underperformed lately, but coaches helped me learn from those mistakes. And man, come game time, I'm spot on, I'm killing it. Why? Because I learned from all those mistakes that I make. So don't focus on how poorly you may feel you may have been in practice lately. Comparison, comparing myself to others. Comparison is the thief of joy. I don't remember who said that, but I love that quote. Comparison is the thief of joy. You want to be uh, miserable? Compare yourself to others, uh, especially as an athlete, right? You're probably always going to find someone else who is better at this than you, better at that than you. They can jump higher. They're stronger. They're, they can uh, do more in the weight room, you know, whatever it is. We compare ourselves to others. We can get spun up in our mind, lose our confidence. We need to make sure we focus on, hey, what is it that I do well? What is it that I feel good about that I bring to the table, right? We all bring different things to the table in our sport. What, what are my strengths? So we don't want to compare ourselves to others. Worry about what other people think of my performance. I've had, I'm working with a basketball player now uh, and he tells me, yeah, sometimes Blake, when I um, take a shot or I maybe I've make a pass and maybe it's a pass maybe I should have made, I look up in the stands to see how my dad is reacting. We don't ever want to be in that situation. Um, talk to your dad after the game. Worry about what your dad's you know, after the game. Because what we need to focus on is, is what? Is our, our game, our competition. We need to focus, be where our feet are. Maybe you've heard that before. Worry about your performance um, and focus on that, not what other people may think about it. Because we tend to be mind readers as people. And we think, well, coach probably wants to bench me now because I'm, I'm playing so poorly. Um, my teammates probably think uh, I'm the worst teammate in the world. You know, we don't need to mind read what we think others might be thinking of. Don't worry about that. Uh, focus on your mistakes, right? You may do a million things right in the game, but you make this one mistake and that's all you can focus on. Surefire way to kill your confidence. Had a bad pregame warm up, Blake. Pregame warm up. I worked with a, um, a D1 uh, athlete, a female basketball player last year. Uh, Lover, great girl, great player. And uh, <laughs> on a senior night, I went to go see her play her senior night. 
And because of the senior night festivities that were going on, her uh, pregame warmup was cut short. It was cut short. And that threw her for a loop, right? Because, wait a minute, I had this routine. And, and that routine that I do, that makes me feel prepared for the game. And it makes me feel confident for the game. And, and Blake, because I couldn't do that, I really just let that get in my mind that, eh, I'm not going to play well tonight. And she didn't play well that night. Um, so whether you had it cut short or you just didn't perform well or up to snuff as you felt in your pregame warmup, uh, we can't let that affect our game. Um, I did a, a story on the app just a, a week or two ago about this, and that is that we can't win pregame warmup. There's no one that says, uh, hey, because Blake had such a great warmup before the game, we're going to give his team two extra points before we even start the clock, right? You can't win pregame warmups. You can't lose pregame warmups. Warm up is just that. Give your body an opportunity to get the blood flowing, get the muscles loose, stretched out, ready to perform. How you do or don't do in pregame warmups has nothing to do with the outcome. We can't let it do that. If we focus on that, then it certainly can affect your performance, and we don't want that to happen. And then finally, I over criticize myself during or after games. If I ask you to raise your hand, have you ever done it? You probably all are going to raise your hand, right? We've all overly criticized yourself. Maybe during the game, maybe after the game, for sure, if not also during. Big issue that I see with a lot of student athletes when it comes to their mental performance. And so I wanted to provide a, an extra slide here that kind of focuses on that, uh, that piece in particular. It's what we call self-talk in the mental performance world. Like, how do we talk to ourselves during practices, during games, during competition, right? Or maybe even after competition, uh, especially if we didn't perform well. How do we speak to ourselves? Um, self-talk, your self-talk, and we all do it, can either fuel or kill your proactive and stable confidence. Either one, proactive, stable, confidence overall. Uh, it can help me feel more confident or it can prevent me from feeling more confident. We obviously want to leverage our self-talk to help us feel more confident so we can perform better. So here's a question. How does your self-talk differ when you're playing good versus when you're not having a, a great game, right? I'm not performing very well right now, Blake. And so my, my, uh, my self-talk definitely changes uh, perhaps. So let me ask this in that chat. And again, you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Um, and again, I want you to keep it rated PG because we might say some rated R things in our head to ourselves. But what might you say to yourself? Let's say you just made a bonehead play in whatever sports you play. You made a, a, a big mistake. Maybe it really hurt your team. What is it that you typically say to yourself when you make a mistake in a game? What does that inner voice say to you? Okay. So coaches are given the right answer. A good answer, I should say. Connor says, focus on the next play. Get it next time, says Ian. Worry about it after the game. Good, Jax. Have a short memory. I like that one. Keep putting in full effort. Thank you for that. I want to have to modify the question. Does anyone ever have any negative self-talk? Because I'm sure that uh, even though, yeah, you're saying great things in my chat right here now, I'm sure there's times when things have happened where you've probably said things more along the lines of this. Man, I suck today. How could I miss that shot? The coach should bench me. I don't even belong out here. My team would be better without me. Right? These are things that... The self-talk is poor. You're giving me great examples there. And hey, if this is always you, I love it. Man, I hope you're saying those types of things to yourself. Unfortunately, too many student athletes struggle with this type of talk. They struggle with negative self-talk. Um, I've yet to work with a student athlete one-on-one -on -one that at some level does not struggle with this. So we need to try to make sure that our self-talk is positive. Um, Good. So 
if that is you ever, then what a good sports psychologist would tell you, like, hey, you need to replace your inner voice. We have this inner voice that speaks to us, it, it tells us things. Uh, we might need to replace it though. So if I struggle with my self-talk and it's always negative or sometimes negative, I need to replace it. And so if I usually say to myself, man, Blake, you suck today, you're, you're horrible. I need to perhaps replace my voice with the voice of someone who I feel like, you know, in that situation, he or she would probably say something good to me. So maybe I replace my inner voice with the inner voice of, of a coach, um, of my best friend, of my mom, my dad, my sibling, someone who would probably say to me the things that you put in the chat. Hey, worry about it uh, after the game. Hey, um, keep your head up. You got it. Uh, you, you got the next shot, whatever it is, right? And we need to replace our inner voice with someone, something that is positive. All right, moving on. Here is the activity that I would love to do with you. Um, so this is where pen and paper come in handy for you, whether you're watching it live, whether you're gonna be watching this later as a recording. Um, if I could single out one single exercise to best help a person to improve their confidence, it's this activity. It's creating a confidence resume. Uh, does anyone here have a job? Anyone here, uh, any of you students ever uh, had a, a job? If so, you can click on the uh, participants and uh, where is it? You can do your hands up. Uh, I forget exactly where it is. I think it's in the participant window. But if you've ever had a job, you maybe have uh, had to deal with writing a resume before. And that's what uh, this exercise is about. It's about writing a resume. Um, so a resume is something that I give to an employer that puts my best foot forward and tries to convince them that, hey, I am the right candidate for the job. This job that I'm applying for, you got to hire me because I have all the skills necessary to do it and to do it well. So the confidence resume is very much similar, uh, but it's more of a resume that is meant for us. It's to remind ourselves that, hey, um, I've got some things going on athletically uh, in my sport that should help me feel confident. It has certain components to it. And so we're gonna walk through the components. So if you have pen and paper, uh, as we get through each of the components, you can kind of create a header. And then you're going to have maybe bullet points underneath. And these bullet points are going to uh, be list of the things that I'm asking you to consider. Now, as you write it, I want you to give the bullet points that you can think of in the lot of time that I give you, but leave some extra space before we move on to the next category, because you might be forgetting things in certain areas. Um, and you might need to go to your parents or to a coach or both and say, hey, um, in this category, there are other things that maybe I do well or have done well that maybe I should consider putting on my resume because you want this to be a, a fully encompassing. I don't care if it went back to when you were six years old, you did that thing, you won that home run derby and six years old, put it on the list, right? <clears throat> These are things for you to consider. So the first section is your why. What is your why? A lot of resumes, when you look at them, they have kind of a purpose statement of, hey, this is kind of the job that I'm looking, looking for. This is kind of what I dream of, of doing and being in life. And they have this statement. And so in a confidence resume, it's really about your why, which is a, a good reminder for you. Like, hey, why am I even playing this sport? Why did I decide to go out for the football team or the basketball team or, or dance or whatever it is that I do? Why do I do this? I think it's always great for us to, one, know what it is. And two, to remind ourselves periodically of, oh, this is why I want to be my best because man, I love the game. I just love the game with all my heart and I want to become the best that I can at it. Maybe your why is uh, I really want to play at the next level. I really want to be a, a college athlete and get to experience that life. Um, maybe uh, I worked with one young man and the only way he was going to college was if he got a athletic scholarship. So his why was, was huge. And he gave great effort to try to achieve that. Uh, so it's always great to know what your why is. So that's the first section. So 
uh, as I've been talking there, hopefully been able to think about, hey, what is your why? It's usually just a, a one sentence statement, maybe, maybe it's two, uh, but what is your primary reason for doing what you do? I will tell you this about, uh, about life, not just sports, but life. The, the bigger your why, the bigger your work. The size of your why directly co uh, correlates to the size of your work. So if you have a strong why, you will give amazing work, um, whether that's athletically, whether that's academically, whether that's in uh, your role as, with an employer one day. Uh, junior year of high school, ladies and gentlemen, I was on the track team for one reason. My why was I wanted to get my picture in the yearbook one more time, just one more time. My buddies and I were having a competition. I was like, yes, that'd be an easy one because it's a no cut sport. I can go out for the track team and boom, mission accomplished. And, and hey, mission was accomplished in the first week of practice. They took the team photo. So, hey, I'm there. Now, do you think I went on to become an amazing track star? Absolutely not. My why was not big enough. My why motivated me to do pretty much zero in practice. I wouldn't push myself. I didn't care about track. I cared about the picture in the yearbook. So we want to make sure we have a, a strong why for whatever it is that we do, whatever we commit to as a person, make sure you have a strong why. All right, the second section of the confidence resume. What are your past accomplishments? In your sport, what are the things that you have accomplished as an athlete? Maybe you made a, a certain team, you made some sort of special all-star team or special travel team or whatever it was, you had certain wins that you were a part of, championships, you know, amazing stats and this, that or the other. Uh, I've won awards, uh, whether they be uh, from grade school up to now in the sport, doesn't matter. This is just your past accomplishments. What have you done? What have you done that when you look back on those things, you're like, yeah, maybe I should have some confidence about my ability in the sport. My son did win the a home run derby when he was like seven U or something. Like, yeah, put it on the list. Why not? <laughs> it counts. So bullet points. Again, list a few here in our time here together. But then think about um, approaching a coach later or a parent later. His parents are great because they remember everything about their kids' accomplishments, right? It's like, oh, you did this, you did that, you did that. They could probably help you double your list uh, pretty quickly if you can't think of all of them. All right, for the sake of time, I'm going to go to the next section, which is your physical skills. What physical skills do you possess that help you in the sport or sports that you play in? You see some examples there that I listed. What are those things that help you out? Hey, I'm, I'm tall. I'm a middle hitter in volleyball. So, hey, that, that helps me, right? So what are the physical skills that, again, contribute to your success in your sport? When it comes to height, things like that, hey, it's just a natural gift. You, you did nothing to earn it. You just uh, were born of the right stock, I guess, and you, you grew as tall as you did. But what are those physical skills you possess that help you in your sport? All right, the fourth section. What are your strengths according to others? So what have other people told you man, you know what? You're really good at this. You're really great at that. Um, you're really skilled in this area or that area. What are, are your strengths? If I were to go and ask other people as a potential employer, when I look at your resume, hey, what, what is he or she good at? What, what do they do that's so good? What are their strengths in baseball, basketball, football, soccer, whatever it is? What are their strengths? And hey, even if it's something that, that you feel like it is, and maybe no one's necessarily affirmed you in that way, put it on the list. Again, this, this is your list. It's a living, breathing document. It's probably going to be, uh, should be updated just like a regular job resume uh, periodically to add new things to your list. But what are your strengths? The fifth section is any special training or coaching that you uh, have received. I know a number of athletes, they go and they uh, work with that special hitting coach or pitching coach, or they go to that special camp that they do every summer at University of XYZ, and uh, they do these clinics and whatever they've done, right? Maybe you do uh, uh, 
whatever. You know more than I do, right? So are there special training and coaching? So outside of your typical practices that you go to for your sport, um, maybe you do some, some extra things, right? To try to get ahead and advance your skills. Sixth section, what about your mental game strengths? So if I were to look at what y'all all answered in the chat, I would say, okay, there's some people here with some strengths that they're able to uh, uh, maybe uh, put mistakes behind them quickly. Maybe you have great focus where there's plenty of teammates out there that don't have great focus. Um, maybe you're always uh, positive regardless of the situation. Maybe you're uh, super resilient, right? That's the, my ability to, to bounce back after mistakes. Um, what are your mental game strengths do you feel you have? Maybe you, your self-talk is, is always positive. Whatever you feel helps you in your mental game. Maybe you spend time visualizing um, success uh, prior to games. That's something that some of the best athletes in the world do. They close their eyes in a quiet place and try to visualize the ball going in, hitting the ball, scoring the goal, whatever it is, uh, visualizing success before they actually go out there and experience success. This is what a confidence resume should include. And I think I've got one more section, yes. So the last section of your confidence resume, what about any positive habits maybe you have that help support you and your um, athletic endeavors? Maybe um, you feel like, you know what, I have good sleep habits, you know, especially prior to games. Um, I, I go to bed at a good hour. I make sure that I get enough sleep. Maybe my diet is spot on, and maybe because of my diet, I'm a better athlete because of it. Um, you tell me, right? So what positive habits might you have? Uh, maybe it's how much you run, how much you lift even. Uh, you just got some habits that really support you. Maybe you spend a lot of time stretching, helping to prevent injury. Um, could be a lot of different things. So a confidence resume. You create, again, bullet points in all these sections and get your headers, ask for help, ask parents, ask coaches, hey, what are some, some things that I do well? Add those to your list. And then people say, well, what do I do with it, Blake? Well, it's not just about creating it and stick it in your desk drawer and forgetting about it. What I recommend to student athletes is to maybe print out a couple of copies, maybe even laminate it. Maybe one goes in my bag that I take with me to every practice, to every game, every competition I have it. And maybe before I take the field, the court, the whatever, I pull it out and I just kind of read through it to help remind me again, working on my proactive confidence, remind me again, why should I be confident going into this game? What have I done that's so daggum good? Sorry, Alabama, daggum came out. What have I done that's, that's so daggum good that, you know what, this is why I should be confident going into this game. And then maybe you, you stick one on the bulletin board at home. Right, so if you kind of got one for your room at home, maybe you read it in the morning before you uh, head off to practice or games or whatever, and then you have one with you should you need to revisit it, even at halftime. Oh, man, I had a horrible first half. I got to regroup here. Let me read my resume again. Um, so again, leverage this. This is a tool. Yes, it's, it's beneficial to just go through it and do it, but it's also beneficial to refer back to, and that's the big uh, reward from getting to do it. Uh, how many of you will do it? Probably few but it's the few that do it that are probably gonna have the most success because with more confidence, you will be more successful. So I challenge you, challenge you to do it. All right, final thing here, just like dribbling a basketball, throwing a football, kicking a soccer ball, all those are skills. Self-confidence is a skill as well. And it is a skill that can be developed. So you just need to decide, hey, am I going to uh, work on developing that skill? It takes practice. It takes the reps. Someone used earlier in the, in the chat the word reps, right? It takes reps. I got to work on the skills that I need to develop. Maybe that's getting into some reading on, on mental, uh, mental training. There's a great book called Mind Gym, G-Y-M. And what I like about it, it has really short chapters, and it's all kind of in the table of contents, categorized by different things. And so if I'm struggling in certain areas with my mental game, I can kind of flip to that chapter and, and read through that chapter. Um, but Mind Gym, M-I-N-D, Gym, G-Y-M. Um, got too many books on my 
uh, shelf to pull it out quickly, but that's a great resource. But maybe uh, again, on that app that coach mentioned, I have every Monday morning, there's a mental game minute. And so it's about a one to two minute video that I drop every Monday morning, 7 a.m., uh, just to kind of things from a mental standpoint for you to focus on. What can I do to help my mental game so that I perform better in my sport? So I offer those things up to you. And again, that app is free. Just search the term battle tested in any app store that you, uh, you have. You'll find it, uh, our triangle logo that you see at the bottom of the slide there. You should be able to see that logo. It's like, oh, that's the one. I need to download that. No cost. So I appreciate your time again just for being here and just showing hey I care enough about you know my mental game to to be here because that's part of me getting better as an athlete and so I did want to open up uh, the last few minutes that we have here to any questions in the area of confidence or maybe it's just a, a question about some other mental performance thing you might like to ask about uh, we got some minutes here for you to do that if you'd like so feel free to unmute yourself Or if you'd prefer to type in the chat, you're welcome to do that. I guess as people are uh, thinking, I'll, I'll start. Um, okay. You talked a, a lot about the confidence resume. And to me, that is um, dealing with that um, proactive comp, uh, confidence, the, the confidence prior to competition. Um, so often I've seen you know, a, a team enter the game with all the confidence in the world and, you know, the other team might run back the opening kickoff and then you can just see the, all the air comes out of the balloon, you know, and everybody, all the confidence is just out the window. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, some of those things that you can do in game? Um, I don't think anybody um, is going to, you know, have time to pull out their, their sheet or anything like that. So what are some of the things that we can do in game to just keep that confidence up if whether you're a leader you're a coach you're you're just a um any any teammate or a fan or you know what have you yeah a great question and then, again i think that's where it's probably one maybe the most critical maybe you could argue hey maybe stable confidence is even more critical than proactive um, but it definitely easy to argue that hey it's the hardest one to maintain right because now things are going south on me it's not going well um you know so definitely the it starts with the self-talk. It starts with, hey, what about me? Maybe on that opening kickoff, I was the guy that, you know, I totally whiffed on the tackle. And you can look at my failure to do my job as maybe leading to that touchdown. And so I'm starting my negative self-talk. Like, Blake, you idiot, how could you do that? You know, he was right there, you should have had him. Um, you know, so we've got to make sure we're talking to ourselves well to keep our confidence level up versus letting that inner devil or demon speak to us and, and try to tear us down. Um, and confidence is one of those few skills where you can actually fake it till you make it. And I know that probably all of you here in this class have heard that before, like, oh yeah, fake it till you make it. And that doesn't work in every situation, but confidence is an area where it can. Like if you just um, begin to act confident, even if you don't feel it, not only Will it help you feel more confident? It helps those around you feel more confident because we are contagious beings, right? So if I'm negative, someone else is negative, positive, others are positive, confident, other people are confident. So definitely from leaders, especially, if you know people look up to you and you have influence on your team, you're considered a leader on your team, fake that stinking confidence. I don't care what the scoreboard says. I don't care how momentum has shifted in the game. If you act more confident, you're much more likely to feel it. And those around you are definitely much more likely to feel it because coaches and leaders, players are feeding off you, right? They're feeding off you. Great question, coach. Others? Uh, so keep, keep them coming. Uh, I do have one in the chat uh, oh, yeah. along, along with what you're saying. How do you deal with uh, difficult team chemistry? Yeah, that's tough. And you know, that that's a, that's a huge kind of culture question where culture is a big word in, in coaching and sports. It has been for a number of years, but you no know, team chemistry is just not there. Right. And when that's not there, man, it can certainly, uh, we, we probably have all seen it where teams just, uh, they don't play well together. You know, they don't, they're not selfless. You know, so <clears throat> to me, so much of teams team chemistry goes back to what kind of job have we done in the preseason 
to establish chemistry because chemistry is something that to me is kind of living and breathing. And what do we, uh, what do we start off our, our season with doing and what do we continue to do throughout the season to make sure that it stays there? So for example, I worked last year with a college basketball team in the area. Um, great preseason team building event with them. I did with them and man, ladies were coming together. It was a beautiful thing. I think there was even tears going on at the end. I mean, it was awesome, this team building event that we had. And the coach contacted me about two weeks left in the season. It's like, Blake, man, we are struggling. We're struggling. Um, could you come and speak to us? And so I went first and I met with the leaders. And what I learned was, was that uh, outside of the practices, teammates did not hang out together. They didn't spend time together. There was no team chemistry going on. There was groups. So there was four different distinct cliques or groups uh, that the team had divided into. And they just spent time with those groups. They didn't intermix at all. And so the leaders had allowed that to happen. And so because of that, team chemistry on game day was just poor. There wasn't trust going on. There wasn't communication. There wasn't selflessness going on that helps us succeed. Uh, sharing of the ball, it was, it was poor. So uh, to me, that really falls on the, the shoulders of the coaches that, you know, hey, what are the coaches doing to help drive that culture that we want, which is to have a great team chemistry. Um, so, you know, team building, team bonding, those things definitely are part of it. Um, I just did a podcast interview in the podcast called The Culture Builders, uh, which might be worth a listen that uh, something that, you know, maybe kind of helps address that as well. Great question though. Any others? Crickets, crickets, I hear crickets. There's gotta be one student that says, hey, man, I got this question. You know what it takes? It takes a little bit of courage. You just step up and lead and, and spit it out. Let's hear it. We're gonna stay on this call until one student athlete Ask one question. I don't care how silly you think it is. I don't care if it's, it applies. <laughs> Who's gonna be my leader? All right, I got something in the chat here that says teammates effort in practice. I'm assuming you're wanting to know, hey, what about uh, how, do we, how do we help teammates effort in practice? How do we improve it? Is that kind of maybe the question, should I assume? Teammates effort and practice. Yes, thank you. All right, so uh, leaders, this is for you. Um, the team will do what you do. More often than not, the team will follow suit with what you do. So if you are a credible leader, meaning that you have established credibility, you are believable. Uh, when you act and speak, people believe you. They trust you. They feel like, uh, yes, you've, uh, you are who you say you are. You have integrity. Um, if you go out there and you bust your butt, um, you are showing people, hey, this is what I expect from you. Now, will they initially bring it out and give it to you? Maybe not. Maybe their why, a lot smaller than your why, right? Um, but if I, as a leader, am credible, and I've built, built up some relational equity with my teammates and showed them that I care for them, I want the best for them, I want the best for this team, if I, as a leader, say to them, hey, I really need you to give greater effort in practice, really need you to step it up in the intensity level in the weight room, whatever it is, they're much more apt to do that if it's coming from you, right? So leaders go first, you show everybody else the expected energy, effort, attitude levels that you know the, the team is trying to have and the coaches are trying to make sure that the team has and you demonstrate them first and then you, you kind of call people up. Now, I don't call them out, you call them up and say, hey, I'm, I'm right here with you. I'm, this is a mountain we're climbing together. Uh, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard work, but man, it's going to be worth it. I'm going to be right here with you every step of the way. I'm not asking you to do anything that I'm not willing to do next to you. Great question. Uh, how do we get everyone to come to practice? Uh. I, I think uh, <laughs> I think what Caden is uh, getting at is, you know, Kate, if I know Caden, so I know um, he is one that attends every single off season opportunity. And when he's saying practice, I know, to him, it is practice because he's never going to miss a day. But I think what really what he's looking for is, and also Diesel on on the chat is, how do you get our or your teammates to get to off season opportunities, putting in the work when it's it's, you know, not during the season, um, just getting all that extra work 
uh, workouts, camps, g- open gyms, and things like that. Yeah. And so part of that, again, is uh, happy asked them, right? It, it may be a, a, an optional off-season thing that are allowed to do. Are you as leaders inviting people into it? You know, so am I doing my job? Am I showing up? So it sounds like you are. Okay, but are you inviting others? Are you challenging others if you need to? If you know there's players there who your team is really going to count on this season and they're not doing their part, have that heart to heart with them. One on one, not in front of everybody. Don't call them out. Don't embarrass them. Say, man, you know, we got some special things we're trying to do this season. You're going to be a big part of that. Right. So try to uh, make them realize their importance. Right. People want to feel needed. People want to feel included. So help them feel that. Yes. You know, uh, it sounds like the team really needs me and they're expecting a lot of from me. And usually that might help call them up a little bit into a greater level of, of effort and attitude. Uh, but, it, but again, it might go back to their why. They might just want the picture in the yearbook. They might just want to wear the jersey. And for those people, there's not a, not a whole lot of help for them. Um, but can I at least do my part as a leader and try to recruit people to come? Workouts are more fun if you're there. So trying to get everybody else to come uh, be a part. Hey, Blake, I think you've mentioned a couple times uh, the term don't call your teammates out, instead call them up. Yeah. Um, do you want to just briefly talk a little bit about what you mean by that? Yeah, I, I do. So as a, as a leader, um, I like to use that mountain analogy. Um, we've all, if you're a leader, you've climbed the mountain, right? You're a leader for a reason. You've done certain things. You made choices in your life that has established you as a leader. And so you've kind of climbed that Mount Everest already. And there are people who look up to you. Right? They, they look up to you and they might put you on a pedestal or whatever, but they respect you. They respect you. They, they hopefully trust you. That stuff is there. Uh, and then I've got players who are, are down in the valley who haven't climbed the mountain yet. Um, am I going to call them out and say, hey, shout down from the mountain. Hey, come on up here. It's great up here. This is what you should do. You know? um, and so to me, that's kind of calling out people, especially when it's in front of someone versus trying to call up someone. To me, it's, it's more relational. It's me coming down the mountain, coming off my, my high horse and coming down and meeting them where they are. Say, hey, I know that right now this is tough for you. Maybe you're not in the, the shape you need to be because you didn't, didn't take care of off, off-season conditioning. Um, so I'm going to be right here with you. And I'm going to be sweating right next to you and doing these um, push-ups and whatever it is I'm doing right next to you. And so it's really kind of climbing back up the mountain with them. So it's trying, going down the valley, recruiting the people and trying to get them to climb that mountain with you, which is that maybe end of season goal that we're shooting for. But there's a big difference between calling someone out and trying to embarrass them and belittle, belittle them in front of the team for not doing something they should be doing. And we all know it, but um, rather maybe that private moment after practice uh, some other time that says, hey, you know, you're a big part of this team. We need you, you know, just really trying to, um, again, make them feel their importance and stuff. Um, so calling up versus calling out. I've um, got a question here. Uh, as a coach or athlete, how do you increase the team confidence in groups of athletes are not showing up in the offseason? So that's, that's, that's similar then, right? Uh, and if they're not showing up, are they going to gain confidence? No, right? Because they're not learning. They're not getting stronger. They're not doing whatever the purpose is of being there. So that goes back to trying to help them discover. And, and maybe if they don't have their own why yet, maybe we help them discover what the why is. Um, every year I work with a softball team and we create a mission statement. And the mission statement is that statement that um, students help craft it. And so there's buy-in. And so we'll create a mission statement, we'll create core values and we'll create standards of behavior. And by creating those things on my team, I now have players who all, they help craft it all. So they can't say this is from coach. And I got to do what coach says. Like, no, we all created this. You said, this is what we're going to try to do this season. We said, this is how we're going to do it. And hey, here's the levels of behavior. This is acceptable. This is not acceptable. And so they define all those things. And so by doing that, they know, right? And so they're able to kind of create a why for the entire team. This is why we exist as a team. It's not just for Blake to get his picture in your book. We have this why that this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to you know, represent our school with pride and do this, that, or the other, whatever the mission statement says. Uh, it kind of helps with, I think, recruiting more people um, buy-in, right? Because it sounds like when people aren't missing and when people are missing those things, we don't have full buy-in of the people who we need to have buy-in from. You know, when everybody shows up, then we know 
and everybody buys into and believes in this mission and they want to be a part of helping us achieve it. So I'm happy to uh, have a separate conversation with coaches about that. Um, so it looks like that's a, that's an issue here. I don't know if these are all one team, but teammates that tend to skip practices and workouts. So I think I've kind of addressed those things here. So any, uh, any final thoughts, questions, comments? I got to go get a son to travel baseball practice before long, but I got a couple more minutes if needed. Well, all right, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate your time, your attention. And for those who are going to watch this later, um, do your homework, do your confidence resume, uh, work on your confidence to go out and be more successful in your sport. I want it for you. You hopefully want it for yourself. I appreciate the opportunity, Coach. I also just want to thank uh, all of you guys for joining and especially for our guest speaker today, Mr. Blake Williams. Uh, for those that joined late, I know um, some of you had to join late. I'm going to put in um, the Battle Tested website along with that mobile app. I know we've talked about it a couple of times, but uh, make sure you go and um, join that. But again, thank you so much. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that will conclude the big eight. Uh, leadership uh, fall series. So thanks again and have a great night, everyone. Pleasure. Take care, gang.